From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. We are recording this on uh, on the evening of July 3rd, as humans reckon the calendar. Here in the United States, there's a birthday coming up. Uh, several birthdays. Statistically, uh, if you're listening to this, it might be your birthday. So happy birthday. Uh, We are going to do a thing that we like to do here in the States, which is celebrate July 4th, Independence Day. A lot of other countries have their own Independence Days, but this one, all us, baby. I don't know if this is the case in uh, cities other than Atlanta, but have you guys noticed that people start shooting off fireworks like days before the 4th of July? Yeah. Last What's night? up with that? It's, it's, yeah. it's a little, little it's, aggressive. It's a sunk cost fallacy, I would say, because you buy the fireworks and then you kind of want to test them and then fireworks are objectively cool. Oh, and you got a, a deal. Point. You got like double the fireworks you thought you were going to get. What are you going to do with all the fireworks? I love that. I told you guys, I do have a um, a shady uncle whose name is literally Uncle Sam. And no one. Stop it. True story. <laughs> no one in my family knows what he actually does. And he won't tell us. But he did spend some time in China working in the fireworks industry. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I thought his name might be uh, Wacky Wayne. You, you know those fireworks stores <laughs> around here? Yeah, They're those. always yeah, wacky. Yeah. Crazy Steve's Firework Emporium. I, I swear I saw many years ago one on the Gulf Coast called like Four Finger Billies or something. That's cute. Yeah. Because he blew off one oh, of yeah. his fingers. Nice. It can happen. Those, what are they, black cats? The ones yeah. that are like, no, M80s, I think, yeah. is the ones that can actually literally explode your flesh. Well, props to you, Billy, if you're still around, because he leaned into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. He made some real. Yeah. Don't lean in too hard. You'll go blind too, Mm -hmm. Willie. Yeah. Over here, they've got cautionary Kyle's fireworks stand. They do not. Cautionary. You're lying. You made that I am lying. I'm lying. (laughs) (laughs) It's just sparklers. They're they're really tiny. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Those little snakes like on South Park that are just like ash. Sparklers are like the CBD of fireworks. Let's be honest. They're you know fun, what I though. Mean? Yeah, they're fun. CBD is fun, but it's not the same thing. Well, but CBD, you know does, does it work? Sparklers at least sparkle. That's know. true. We're also going to learn about, uh, we're going to have an update on a trial that we've been following. We're going to have an, a discussion about artificial intelligence. I think we're all excited for Uh, We're going to learn more about uh, mRNA because we did mention it for a reason in a previous episode. Uh, But before we do any of that, we're going to pause for a second and get to our um, our kind of breaking story for this evening. And we're back. <sighs> We've talked about it before. And as we get into this, uh, Doc, apologies to you. When we were talking about this off air, uh, our <laughs> our poor super long producer, suffering, long yeah. suffering. That's the word. Uh, just shook her head and said, I had managed to forget about this. For just a couple of minutes. I believe the expression was, I managed to forget that we live in hell. Uh, Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And this is in reference to uh, something called the Supreme Court of the United States, long a controversial institution uh, in the most recent sessions of the Supreme Court. They made rulings that seem, uh, depending on your perspective, uh, to be either quite reasonable or quite problematic. Now, is there no middle ground then? Well, now, yeah. yeah, I don't think there's anybody who goes, Meh, okay. It's yeah, fine. That's yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. It's, Our uh, mids. Uh, this is the thing. Okay. So we've talked about it uh, to many of our friends who are not in the U S we know it sounds weird, ostensibly a democracy, the United States, the laws of the land are ultimately decided or adjudicated by 
nine kind of ring wraiths. Uh, they are not elected officials, as in the public doesn't get to vote for them. They're confirmed by Congress. Uh, they have tremendous legal power, and they are meant to be a check on the power of the other two branches of government, the executive and the legislative. It is weird that they're never up for election, kind of like the Pope. They have the job for as long as they want. And I guess we're in sort of a weird situation because, you know, one, a long sitting justice passed away. So the previous president was able to appoint way more than usually get appointed during a sitting president's term. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one of the big, big powers of the um, of the executive branch in this respect. Now, we know that talking about anything that touches on the domestic political sphere can be divisive, especially in these times. It can be a sensitive subject. However, what we're going to do at the top of this evening's strange news is explain how this is a conspiracy. Right. We, please check out our earlier episodes on things like Project 2025. And please understand that when we're talking about this. We are not. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that we are not championing some polemic agenda. We're not up for election. You know what I mean? We don't even have a Webby. So we're <laughs> we're not the <laughs> folks in charge of this. Yeah. Uh, but we are going to show you objectively why. You should be concerned about this. If you live in the United States, absolutely. But guess what? If you don't live in the United States, this stuff is going to reach out and touch you too. Uh, how would you guys, as we're getting into it, how would you guys describe your reactions to recent uh, Supreme Court rulings? Like, um, I mean, obviously the big one uh, we'll get to in a second, but let's start with, uh, uh, let's start with rolling back federal regulations. Or how those are decided. Not good. You don't feel good about it? <laughs> Not great. Is no. this the Chevron decision? Yes, yes. This is the Chevron decision. The Chevron decision uh, with SCOTUS. You could already tell by the name. It is, uh, it is about companies. And what it is about what a company, a private entity functioning in, in the United States must do uh, to remain legal. And there was a, what they did is uh, back in 1984, there was a landmark decision called Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council, and they found against Chevron. This gave rise to what we call the Chevron Doctrine. Without getting too into the weeds, uh, you can read a great piece on this by Amy Howe at the SCOTUS blog. What we need to know about this is the Chevron Doctrine which again has stood for decades, uh, says that if Congress has not directly addressed a specific question at the center of a dispute, then a court has to defer to the agency in charge. So, for example, just keeping it really hypothetical here, uh, if the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, had an interpretation of something about food safety or, you know, how much rat feces should be in Raisin Bran? The answer is two scoops. Uh, if, <laughs> if As many do. scoops as there are raisins. <laughs> but, you know, they have these laws, right? Like to what degree of uh, what thresholds are there for contamination such that the safety of the public is not endangered? Under the Chevron doctrine, the courts would have to defer to the FDA's decision about this. Which kind of makes sense because they're the people whose job it is to know these things. And we know there are problems with those agencies as well in terms of the revolving door of folks moving from the industries that are regulated by these agencies to the agencies themselves. Uh, so, you know, in the best of situations, there's already conflicts of interest. And this just, I mean, nukes. The whole any semblance of like expertise being, you know, utilized by these agencies to your point, Ben, which is their job to do. Yeah, yeah. A, a better example would probably be the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, had an interpretation of the Clean Air Act, right, uh, regarding how emissions, fossil fuel emissions in particular, should be regulated. 
when you roll back stuff like the Chevron doctrine, uh, it means that there's going to be legal chaos because we no longer have an order of operations for decision making. Now, this sounds really boring until your water turns brown, right? This sounds stupid and academic until you uh, realize that you can find fingers in cans of chili, right? This opens the door to return to the days of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. It is yeah. it is a dangerous and um, it should be an apolitical concern. It doesn't matter who you vote for. You need stuff at a certain level of cleanliness. But it benefits yeah. the polluters. It benefits the companies who are you know, responsible for these, uh, these emissions or potentially dangerous drugs or food, whatever. It just, it, it opens it up for them to F around and find out kind of, I'm sorry, Matt, what were you saying? It's okay. I just had to say, I, I read through a lot of the writing on this guys and I'm still a bit confused and I'm trying to put it in like more simple terms. Mm -hmm. I think you've kind of done it already, Ben, like saying that before, if there was a court case with a company versus the federal government, the law, whatever it is, if it's vaguely written, you default to whatever the federal regulating body says, like yeah. what, what their rules are, basically. It's kind of allowing them to make jurisprudence. Yeah. Yeah. The entity that's trying to either protect the environment or the consumer or whatever it is, the federal entity that's doing some kind of regulation on corporations, on private entities, you go with whatever that regulator says. But now it's saying that's it's just every court gets to make its own decision about each one of those things now. Yeah. Now it's saying, now it's saying, remember 1984? Psych. Because SCOTUS is famously behind on their street slang. So they still say stuff like cowabunga and psych. But they, <laughs> they did roll. Yes. To you, you, uh, your answer is, or your understanding is astute here. Now, we are not ourselves legal experts. Uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have many. Uh, many of our fellow listeners in the crowd who are legal experts, and we would love to hear some explanations about this. Now, the the current, well, the thing is, for the entirety of its history, the Supreme Court has always been um, fertile soil for corruption and influence. And these people do try to do the right things, and they've made they've made laws that have made the world and the United States a better place objectively, but they are continually accused of political machinations, especially because they recently ruled, and I was complaining about this in previous recording, they recently ruled that ethics, uh, the ethical regulations of the justices themselves should be overseen by the justices themselves. Yikes. I know, and I can't get out of a late fee at the library. This is ridiculous. Question before we maybe move on, we could probably talk about this for the whole episode, this, these decisions, but it's not to say that there will always be a legal kerfuffle around simple things, but does it necessarily also mean that anyone could question something or file a suit or create a legal kerfuffle and therefore throw everything into disarray? Like if there are bad actors and there are like maybe lobbyists or whomever, lawyers on the on the behalf of these corporations, they could challenge these laws and then it would, it could potentially cause chaos or, or have them change without the oversight of a supposedly benevolent regulatory well, body? That That's, yeah, no one knows. That's the issue. But isn't that, is that potentially on the table? I mean, that seems like a thing that could now happen. Doesn't it endanger some of these federal agencies because it may end up costing them too much money in the yes. short to long term mm -hmm. to fight all of the legal battles that will, you know, will be presented to them because there are, there are constant legal battles. If we think about the court cases where it's, oh, well, let's just use Chevron again, Chevron, BP, whoever, gas company versus the federal government because they're trying to settle some dispute about regulations that are being imposed on them by the federal government. Right. right. Yeah. So, so then those, the, you know, the organization like the EPA or whatever it is has to go to court and eat all those Defend. costs right, every right. time. Death right. by a thousand cuts. That's the legal strategy of a lot of these powerful entities. And the, um, it was like what I was saying on Twitter earlier. I feel like every law student should get a full refund on their tuition. Because the stuff they were taught may not 
Hold. apply right yeah. at this point but isn't also project 2025 kind of all about eroding these agencies and yes. doesn't this further contribute to the overall like big picture erosion of the powers of these agencies and to matt's point potentially you know eating them out of house and home to the point where they can't even afford to exist anymore let me put it this way in the most simple terms most simple apolitical terms corruption is a team sport right they don't get a lot of successful lone wolves, or if you do, they don't last for uh, as long as they could. And this brings us to the big fish, the, uh, the, the big issue that people have. And if you are American, you should have an issue with this too. Recently, in a, uh, just a few days ago, in a mic drop moment, the Supreme Court finally issued their opinion on a case called Trump versus the United States. That's right, folks. The name of the case is officially a former president versus the country uh, that he served as commander in chief of for a while. And what what they found in this decision, uh, which was divided clearly along ideological lines of the court, uh, what they found was that in their opinion, any U.S. president, just like any Russian president, will have broad immunity from criminal prosecution a license to commit crimes so long as they, how they put it, use the official powers of their office to do so. So the Overton window has shifted. Now the question is not, was insert here a crime? The question is, was it official? You know what I mean? Doesn't this mean that Nixon was not a crook? It says Watergate, you know, would have been totally chill. <sighs> this is wrong. It's it's so weird. It's... <laughs> It's it is weird to me because it does seem to draw a sharp line between those things that are done as a private action versus, as you said, an official action. Right. right. So you it doesn't necessarily mean on the surface that the president is, has complete immunity, but it does mean if the president does something that is, let's say, illegal it could be argued by that president and everybody around that president that whatever the action was was taken as an official duty mm -hmm. right what's the criteria for that though is it laid out or is it pretty vague <laughs> no, no it's dude. pretty vague yeah because yeah. yeah. if you're if you're trying to pull a grift you know uh, the thing about lying to a large group of people is you got to swing big you know you want to minimize specifics you want to access emotion right so a divided, tribalized, or dare I even say near balkanized public like the United States, uh, they're going to they're going to be strongly pushed toward voting like uh, the way you would root for a, a football team. Right. Instead of looking objectively at the dangers here and make no mistake, we talked about this in Project 2025. It's too much power. It's un-American, and it's very difficult to imagine any president that would not, in practice, take advantage of this. I want to go to the specific dissent here from— I was going to say. Yeah, Justice Kentaji Brown Jackson uh, wrote a quote that really stood out, uh, I think, to a lot of us, and said, quote, from this day forward, presidents of tomorrow will be free to exercise the commander in chief powers, the foreign affairs powers, and all the vast law enforcement powers enshrined in Article 2, however they please, including in ways that Congress has deemed criminal and that have potentially grave consequences for the rights and liberties of Americans. She is, the justice here is not being hyperbolic. It is crazy that our Project 2025 episode came out and then this followed almost directly on the heels of it. I'm not saying they listen to our show. <laughs> uh, you know, if you if you guys do listen, though, you know, buy us off. We're yeah. corrupt. We want to be on the team. Give us a Webby. Or maybe just yeah. chill. Uh, and then another dissenting opinion from Sonia Sotomayor said uh, an excerpt, uh, today's decision to mm -hmm. grant former presidents criminal immunity reshapes the institution of the presidency which is uh, kind of inarguably. Accurate. And also with fear of democracy, right. with fear for yeah. democracy, Doom. I dissent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is my opinion, guys. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with potentially next former president, Donald Trump or Joe Biden or anyone mm -hmm. in the next, 
what, 12 years. <laughs> it it's coming down the road. I Can we quickly read just a couple of quotes? Because this is absolutely it's scary when you see it. Yeah. And there's a big point I want to end with. Yeah, just some of the majority opinion written by Justice Roberts here. Right. That's Chief Justice John Roberts. Something about courts may not inquire into the president's motives. Like, that's scary to me. Yeah. Quote, in dividing official from unofficial conduct, courts may not inquire into the president's motives, which is insane. Yeah. But it is up to the lower courts to decide what constitutes a a presidential act. So isn't that sort of like a... I don't know. That seems like a, what's the word I'm looking for? A contradiction of terms where it's up to them to decide what is a presidential act, but they also can't take into account whether it was self-serving and not in the service of the office or of the people or of the country. And here's the issue also. It goes further to say people who do not support this idea of a president above the law, uh, they would naturally wonder well surely it'll like you're saying go to the lower courts uh surely prosecution and appeals can wend their way through the uh glacial legal system doubtful well they cut it off at the pass you could say that they already hamstrung possible prosecution roberts continues in his statement and he says a prosecutor cannot quote admit testimony or private records of the president or his of advisors in in quote in figuring out if there is an official act is a crime uh <laughs> that means the president can be whomever they may be can be prosecuted for a unofficial act but the prosecutors cannot prove whether this president committed a crime using evidence from the president's official actions it is so mm, there's an umami to it i can't help but uh admire the cognitive parkour Pretty sure I've seen this meme already, but if not, it belongs in this format. Joe Biden has the chance to do the the most hilarious thing ever with this new power because it essentially means you could have a political rival assassinated if you see or or judge that it is a threat to democracy. But you would never have to say that. That's exactly right. The criminal court. So you could just do it. (laughs) <laughs> probe into any of the motivations. Uh, you can't provide testimony that mm. would call into question the motivations of yeah. any sitting president or their advisors. Exactly. Uh, this could be, this does include, this does encompass things up to and including murder or uh, for some of us even worse, treason, right? And this leads us to, here is why I posit this is an apolitical Concern. This is an everyone is in this together concern. It does not matter who you vote for. It does not matter. Your political ideology is your own. Your spiritual ideology, it's your own. The beautiful thing about this country is you don't get murdered for disagreeing with people so far. Uh, this is create, this is a direct contradiction of one of the big things the imperfect founding fathers were all about. You know, we know what they loved. They loved silly wigs and and stockings. They were problematically into enslaving people. And they also f***ing hated monarchies. That's like one of the main reasons they started this whole weird experiment. No kings, right? This feels weirdly monarchical. If that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. It's like somebody saying, hey, as the new managers of the fire department, we looked into, you know, our bylaws And we really should be setting more houses on fire. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, those same guys also thought, "Mm, we shouldn't let the peons really decide Mm -hmm. who the next president's going to be. We should come up with some form of institution, a college of sorts, that would Mm -hmm. actually make the informed decision while, you know, the peons get to vote in their silly little election. And a couple of those, a couple of those slick bastards tried to get George Washington to be a king, Mm -hmm. which was dumb. Not everybody agreed. They had crazy ideas. Ben Franklin looked at the alphabet and said, I've got a better take. Thomas Jefferson looked at the Bible and said, I have some notes. You know what I mean? (laughs) These, these were real hold my beer guys. Plus they were often drunk, if we're being honest. But they had a cool idea, including no more kings. (laughs) including no more kings. And thank you for bringing us back to that because that's the point we need to stay on. This is literal stuff they don't want you to know. Not 
necessarily what's happening now. That's all in the public sphere. But the consequences, right? The long-term plan, not next year, but the next five years, the next 10, the next 12. Uh, and we want to hear your thoughts, whether or not you are a legal scholar, uh, what do you foresee as the possible fallout of uh, treasonous Supreme Court? ConspiracyDieHeartRadio.com. We'll be back after a word from our sponsors. And we've returned. We're going to stay in court for a moment, not the supreme um, one. Um, 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 <laughs> but the court it, of the Crimson King, perhaps? Uh, no, the court of Massachusetts. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Uh, Technically, uh, the sexiest court. Oh my God! I tell you what. Actually, the uh, the specific court here is the Norfolk Superior Court in Dedham, Massachusetts. Ooh, I'm getting Dedham. all hot and bothered. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Real smoke shows up yes. in that courtroom. Yeah, we're jumping back to the Karen Reed murder trial that we've been following since it was brought to our attention almost exactly one year ago, guys. I retract my sex jokes. <laughs> This is a murder trial. This is a murder trial. Yeah, okay. Very true. I'm Uh, I'm buttoning my shirt back up. Sorry. (laughs) No worries. Took it too far. But uh, Max Tout brought it to our attention almost exactly a year ago in July 2023. And uh, we're going to give you yet another refresher as this is another update from that trial. Uh, Karen Reed is a person, a woman who was accused of killing her boyfriend, a Boston police officer named John O'Keefe. It is alleged by the people bringing those charges against her that she hit him with her car in Canton, this is in Canton, Massachusetts, on January 29th, 2022. Uh, she has, ever since charges have been brought to her, ever since the incident, uh, denied any involvement and claims that her boyfriend was, in fact, killed at a house party where his body was found right outside of it. Uh, The house party that had lots and lots of police and other law enforcement officers on hand. I guess they were also attending that party. There's also an alleged dog attack, all kinds of stuff. Very, very complicated. So uh, Karen Reed was charged with second degree murder and manslaughter while operating under the influence and leaving the scene of personal injury and death. If she would have been convicted of these charges, she would have spent the rest of her life in jail. And it should be noted, the defense, uh, the attorneys that were working for Karen Reed, attempted to paint a picture of an elaborate conspiracy by the law enforcement officers who were there at that party, as well as others that were working in official capacities uh, and other people who were, you know, witnesses for the court in this case. Well, Uh, After all the evidence was laid out, after all the testimony, after all the closing arguments were completed, Karen Reed's fate was in the hands of the jury, and after 27 hours of deliberation, they failed to reach a verdict, you guys. Oh. Hung jury. Yes. The trial's over. And Judge Beverly Canone, that's how you say your name, C-A-N-N-O-N-E, she declared it a mistrial and set July 22nd as the next day for the court to get back in session to decide what's going to happen next. It's a pretty big deal. There's a lot of writing happening right now about it and what's going on and also what's specifically going on with this guy, Michael Proctor, who was the lead investigator. Lots of weird stuff in there. If anyone was following the case, this is the guy who was, you know, leading the investigation and then also texting with personal friends and colleagues about Karen Reed and saying some pretty messed up things. And it's very strange, very, very strange trial. But I guess that's the update. If anyone has any specific things they want to talk about, I guess just send your thoughts our way. You can email us or we'll tell you how to call us at the end here. Uh, But yeah, mistrial, guys. It's weird. It's weird how that can work, where basically defense attorneys, all they have to do is create enough doubt about the uh, the official charges. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the investigation to make some jurors, even just a few, maybe just one even say, no, I absolutely will not come to a unanimous decision with you about guilt or not guilt here. We've all seen, you know, Twelve Angry Men, which is just a masterwork. And I've actually Hollywood. not seen it, and I need to it's great, very man. much. It's Dude. great. I I sometimes uh, look around our cohort and wonder who I would cast as like members of a jury and what kind of conversations we would have. Because over the years, we've had some really intense and strange conversations. Mm-hmm. But to that point, however, 
about a case being tainted. It's something that prosecutors take very seriously because in this judicial system, something that goes wrong or something that is a uh, an unethical act or outside of procedure for the quote unquote good guys, uh, then that can ruin the case regardless of if the criminal action is pretty certain. Right? Oh, yeah. You've heard that before, and that's a huge trope in American media. Shoddy police work, right? Mm, oh, ruin the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in the hey, in this case, right after the mistrial was declared, we're talking hours. This uh, trooper Michael Proctor, he's a, he's a Massachusetts state police officer. <laughs> he was relieved of duty and reassigned uh, from his role as an investigator with the Norfolk District Attorney's Office. They were like, you did so bad in this whole thing, uh, you're gone. And doesn't he have an IA investigation? On internal, yeah, internal affairs investigation going on with that guy right now. Not uh, a good week. Not, not great. Good week. Not great. But it makes you wonder about, you know, what don't we know and what won't we ever know because of, you know, what they find in that internal investigations case. Well, and the hung jury is the ultimate tool of like things like jury tampering as well. Like that's what you hope for is, you know, some plant that's like the lone holdout that keeps a unanimous decision from being rendered. But in this case, it doesn't mean this isn't I'm going not, back not, to trial, right? No, 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 no it, of course it does. But it's like a ultimate kind of hang up and it, 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 it seeds doubt as well. You know, <sighs> mm-hmm, I want to mm-hmm. be on American jury duty so bad. Have you guys <laughs> both done it? I never I'm, get cast. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't describe it as an audition, but it does feel like an audition. They can tell I'm too on board well, with I, civic duty. I think I've mentioned I was cast once and I do feel like I swayed some of the jurors um, in what I would argue is a positive direction. It was a civil case and it was about awarding somebody some some damages. But then the second time I, I, I did the audition, I was not cast. And it was because uh, the you know, they basically present to you the basics of what the case is to the point where you kind of get the gist of what's going on, how the injured party was injured. And it involved uh, a kidnapping type situation and a hold up. And I had experienced a situation where a neighbor of mine was um, home invaded and shot. And the neighbor, a friend of mine, came to my house bloodied and tied up. And uh, I expressed this story. And I think they counted me out because they thought I would be maybe too triggered by my experience. On my end, I think it's just that it's the same thing that happens when I'm in an exit row at a plane and I have mm. to give the verbal yes. I'm just like a little too on board. You know <laughs> Open your I eyes mean? a little too I wide. Got, I got some Manson <laughs> eyes and I'm like, yeah, let's go to court. You right. know? Uh, I don't know about juror number 742. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's something in the eyes. Uh, but this also... You know, I I appreciate the point you're making about how this can be kind of a black box, right, in terms of what options will be pursued, how things will shake out. But one thing I love about this is the it returns us to the point we always make, which is just because something has left the big headlines doesn't mean the story is concluded. Kind of like vaccines. Hey, thank you, Ben. Do, 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 do. <laughs> For the second part of this segment, we are talking bird flu, boys. H5N1 avian flu. We've talked about it on the show before. Talked about how it's getting in the cows. It's transferred to the cows, bird to cow. Not good. Now we're watching humanity, that is. Whether or not it's going to go from cow to human. Because mammal to mammal is a little easier than avian to mammal, and it already did that. Zoonotic, is that right? Yeah, when it jumps zoonotic. From, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's in the cattle. It's in some of the milk, according to the people who watch the milk. <laughs> I thought you were going to say according to people who drink milk, as though there's some weird, edgy demographic. Um, I'm sure I, I there is. Know. The ones that like the raw stuff. <laughs> They're the edgy milk drinkers. You oh, will God. call her. <laughs> They're, just, they're just out there. The McPoyles are out there just raw dog and milk. Right? Yeah, always. Uh, but no, but no, nothing, no, no aspersions cast on the milks. Do uh, as you will. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Besides, you know, some of the barbaric ways they get the milk out of the cows, you know, and they have mm-hmm. to make them have babies and then take the babies away from them so they can make oh, enough milk. Whatever. Oh, it's all good. Forcing oh. lactation. Oh, God. I didn't also, know that. Have you guys ever milked a cow? No. You gotta really squeeze those nips. That's it, for sure. I've seen it, video. Put me yank off. Them. 
it put me off milk for a while. And you know I love cheese. I try not to think about it, but yeah. Do you guys, I just watched an old Tom Green video where he, do, where he sucked get, it right out of the teeth. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. he does. And yeah. it's a, I think he might have been the first one to do it in that capacity on camera. He uh, was a real trailblazer <laughs> in many respects. That's real Tom pioneer, Green. that guy. <laughs> <laughs> My bum is on the step. He, he was immortalized <laughs> in an Eminem song. I, it it was, just occurred yeah. to me the other day. A lot of people forgot Tom Green, mm-hmm. except in that Eminem thing where yeah, history <laughs> would be like, who is he talking about? What is he talking about? What is Eminem talking about in this line? It and was the, the Tom Green show. Delivered a it certainly kids. was. With and Glenn. expect them not to know what a woman's clitoris is. Exactly. Of course, they're going to know what intercourse is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. Um, what are we talking about, guys? The, oh, yeah. Uh, vaccines. The vaccines. <laughs> uh, zoonotic. Uh, we're, yes. <laughs> we're delivering on our earlier tease uh, about mRNA conversations, I think. Right. Oh, okay. We're going to get to, yeah, we're going to get to mRNA uh, vaccines. Okay, so. The reason why we're talking about this avian flu is because we've been chatting about it for a while. Scientists have been warning, raising little signs everywhere across the world saying, guys, this is kind of weird. This is not good. And Mm. now, at least according to uh, a Reuters article that I read this week, that I think we all read, perhaps, titled Scientists Wary of Bird Flu Pandemic, quote, unfolding in slow motion. Now. Could that be scare tactics? Yes, it could be. Could it be scientists actually saying, hey, the public and, you know, journalists, a lot of us don't really notice pandemics until they're really on that upward swing, you know? And uh, what these scientists are trying to say is we're noticing that we might be on that low, low bell curve right at the beginning. It feels like that to us. We want to raise a bigger flag now. And uh, since that is occurring, as you were saying, Ben, that mRNA vaccine that we all know because that's a new, a brand new technology for vaccines that was introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic that we all went through, where Moderna and Pfizer and a couple, a bunch of other companies attempted to use this new technology as a way to fight viruses via vaccine, right? Uh, the M- mRNA thing. Well, the real kicker here. <laughs> is that Moderna is being given or granted, let's say, is that how you would say it? They've been given a grant by the government, or at least they've been tapped by the government uh, to develop an mRNA vaccine for the next flu pandemic, the next outbreak. In this case, it would be avian flu. Which has always, I think for many years now, avian flu has been a... I don't want to call it a back burner concern, but it's been a consistent part of uh, what scientists are warning us about. Like, as you mentioned, Noel, zoonotic, the zoonotic aspect of an avian flu uh, that could, I mean, they already have, we already have instances of this. A lot of scientists mm-hmm. will tell you uh, it's, it's similar to the idea of uh, the Yellowstone eruption, right? It is geologically certain. Mm-hmm. We're not exactly sure when. So when scientists are talking about a possible bird flu pandemic, there they have been, at least we know over the past few decades, increasingly talking not in terms of if, but in terms of when. Haven't yep. we had minor bird flu pandemics yes. that were quite yes. deadly? Well, More not so, pandemics. We've well, had okay, whatever, outbreaks, outbreaks right? but but they were quite quite deadly. <laughs> I would, couldn't you argue more deadly even than COVID? Because people were killed, not necessarily because of byproducts of of the condition, but because of the condition itself. Um, I, I, guys, it's been a minute. I'm sorry. I'm just not reaching back into the memory banks, but for some reason, it it occurs to me that when we had instances of bird flu, it was real bad. I would say when these types of zoonotic diseases jump to humans in with their zoonotic behavior, uh, they are more dangerous than stuff that humans have encountered before because we have no immunity. There's no herd immunity. That's why the vaccines were so important during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Uh, when a bunch of people really quickly get sick with the same thing and nobody has immunity, you can get everybody sick. And then it just becomes what is, you know, what's the... What is the mortality rate of this thing, right? I think it's 50% uh, is what I'm reading online right now. Perhaps of this new one? Well, no. Or this the, new strain? In the, past, in the past, it was okay. 50%. So that, that would be like maybe the H7N9 in China. Yeah. Mm. And what we're talking about H5N1, is H5N1, actually. Is yeah. the new one. That's right. 
but sorry, the, shiny new the bug. mortality rate of the bird flu, according to Yale Medicine, that we've experienced thus far was 50 percent. Okay. Almost 900 people around the world that got infected. Well, all the more reason to get Moderna, this huge corporation that's already had a home run with their COVID-19 vaccines to create a new one. Right. They're being paid one hundred and seventy six million dollars to quote, accelerate development of a pandemic influenza vaccine that could be used to treat bird flu in people. That is from AP News posted on July 2nd, 2024. Um, Why is this a weird thing? Well, that's because there is still so much skepticism and fear about this specific vaccine technology out there. If you go on TikTok, Instagram, any of these places, you will see countless humans saying this very thing out loud, how dangerous this vaccine technology is, how it is doing various things and how, you know, rumors of various world leaders and billionaires who are attempting to get stuff into all of us through these vaccines. Much of this, if not most of it, is just hearsay, rumors, conspiracy theories that are unfounded. The one thing that is founded is that this is a relatively new form of technology, a new way to treat, you know, uh, diseases via vaccine, which, you know, all of us were kind of the test subjects in the first round from 2019 onwards. So it is a bit weird that we're going this way again. I don't know. I just want to put that out there that it gives me pause thinking about it. Yeah, because again, it's the, and we're not necessarily co-signing some of the more out there conspiracies not at all we yeah but we are arguing it's a matter of longitudinal data right what happens over time and the problem is when stuff comes out without the public being prepped for it without scooting that perspective in overton window toward normalization then it sounds like a new crazy thing which kind of the science is amazing it is sort of a new crazy thing if we're being honest but because of that and because of all the other stuff people have heard associated with uh, these scientific concepts like DNA and RNA. For most people, when you hear uh, mRNA, then you're immediately thinking of what, like Mm Ancestry.com, Copaganda, Cold Cases, True Crime Podcast. You know what I mean? It's got, it's a weird melange of things, right? All, Mm -hmm. all soaked up in there. So maybe... I don't know. It's always right to ask questions, but it is also true that with any new technology, there is potential for unforeseen consequences. I'm trying to be very careful about saying that. We just, we haven't spoken to, no one has come back from the future in linear time and told us, you know, uh, I'm from 150 years uh, after you guys and mRNA has wrecked the planet. Right. Or it's, it was the best, man. It really fixed everything. <laughs> Guys, the future is so chill. Do you have any spare? Got rid of my RNA? sciatica. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. Moderna is the new president this year. It's intense. The presidents um, are all now companies. Too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's going to happen no matter what the outcome of this citizenship flu plus. Oh, my God. America premium. Yes. If you're interested in this stuff, look up Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority or BARDA. That's the program that awarded Moderna this $176 million to accelerate the development of a pandemic influenza vaccine. All right. Tell us what you know about this stuff, what your thoughts are, and we will be right back with more strange news. And we've returned with one more piece of strange news. Ben, it was uh, oddly prescient that you mentioned with new technology often comes unforeseen consequences. (laughs) Um, We've (laughs) talked a lot about uh, the use of AI, of of generative AI, of machine learning, whatever your, you know, expression du jour is to describe this new technology that is advancing rapidly. Um, The funny thing is, a lot of what we're seeing is a little clownish. We're seeing it used for stuff like making cute anime portraits of of ourselves or generating goofy songs or whatever. And we, you know, we certainly have seen interesting, you know, kind of uh, effective, positive uses of it. But a lot of it has been stuff that gives us pause in terms of like trying to automate 
people's jobs into oblivion, you know, using AI, things like ChatGPT, which is still, while impressive, not great. I've been watching YouTube videos over the last few days with a buddy of mine who pointed out that the AI generated subtitles on YouTube, while often okay, uh, when you watch like old Monty Python episodes, leave a lot to be desired. Uh, they get real jammed up on British slang and, you know, certain colloquialisms and things. So it's actually kind of almost an extra layer of comedy to watch the ridiculous things that the AI subtitles say. Anything with an accent, also a lot of spoken word or uh, hip hop. Uh, it, it's kind of, you know what it reminds me of, Noel, is it reminds me of uh, being in a different country and finding or watching a foreign film that has like the English subtitles yep. and the pro move, if you want to get real weird with it, find a very popular foreign film like Kung Fu Hustle, get the DVD that already has some subtitles and then watch it with another set of subtitles on top of it. And then you'll see how tricky it is for humans to translate things. Right? Those kind of colloquial sort of expressions that are yeah. very dependent on meter and, and rhythm of speech and cadence and all of that stuff. But what we're really talking about today, the unintended consequences that I was hinting at is uh, power consumption. Um, you know, despite a lot of the things that we're seeing AI being used for seeming somewhat frivolous, we know beneath that it's being developed uh, relentlessly by a lot of giant companies to use for God knows what. <laughs> That's the part that we don't fully understand yet. And with that uh, comes these kind of, I guess they're chips um, called uh, AI accelerators um, and also just the processing power that it takes to run all of the cal computations, you know, to generate these goofy videos or, you know, whatever, uh, anime portraits. And it is kind of insane, um, the uh, increase in power demand to the grid that we're seeing with these uh, these next generation chips, with these AI accelerators, and with the increased demand on just AI in general. Uh, a conversation we were having a handful of years ago around this was people who were using graphics cards and processors, GPUs, to run crypto mining operations and how much power was being sucked from the grid to do these crypto mining situations and how people would just stack these, you know, almost like private server rooms full of these graphics cards and just constantly yeah. be running them. And it was, you know, generating insane amounts of demand on the grid. Well, think about that and, you know, multiply it by an order of magnitude higher. Um, there is a great article on Forbes, AI power consumption rapidly becoming mission critical. And just to, just to quote the first uh, paragraph here from Beth uh, Kindig, Big tech is spending tens of billions quarterly on AI accelerators, which has led to an exponential increase in power consumption. Over the past few months, multiple forecasts and data points reveal soaring data center electricity demand and surging power consumption. The rise of generative AI and the surging GPU shipments is causing data centers to scale from tens of thousands to 100,000 plus accelerators, shifting the emphasis to power as a mission critical problem to solve. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's, I love that you're mentioning the crypto, uh, the crypto carbon consequence. If you want to be alliterative, uh, to my understanding here, one of the issues is that the public overall still doesn't have a full grasp on, like, we know some stats for Google, right? Or Alphabet, I should say, but we don't know the full global consequences of this power demand uh, in terms like we, I don't know. I, I think it'd be smart to have AGI immediately figure out improvements in solar technology. That's probably the easiest way around it. That's interesting that you should say that Ben, another article that I wanted to bring up is by Chuck DeVore, who I believe is uh, with the uh, Texas public policy foundation um, and he wrote an op-ed for The Federalist, the title being AI's insatiable appetite for energy can't be satisfied by renewables. So, oh, oh boy. Well, it's also, I, I'll say it, it's also The Federalist. Yeah. Fair enough. But the, the pull quote here is AI is bringing an unprecedented surge in energy consumption, whether policymakers understand the energy implications or not. And he says... Uh, 
In the realm of artificial intelligence, where data crunching and machine learning algorithms reign supreme, the demand for energy has emerged as a critical concern. Mark P. Mills, the executive director of the National Center for Energy uh, Analytics at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which this gentleman, Chuck DeVore, oversees, argues that the energy requirements for the AI systems are far more substantial than most of us know. Um, his insights paint a sobering picture of the energy landscape that awaits us as AI continues its relentless advance into every facet of modern life. He says uh, the global or actually, according to the International Energy Agency, the global electricity consumption by AI alone could reach 1000 terawatt hours annually by 2026, slightly more than the total electricity consumption of Japan. Wow. Uh I was just looking at that Forbes article, Noel. It just it's laying out all of the wattage used per they call them accelerators, the GPUs basically that are being yeah. put out by all these companies. And talking about how it's a some of them have a 50%, 75%, 300% increase in power of usage over each generation and just trying to track that and figure out like where what is that thing called guys where you hit the you hit the peak. So there's two things in my mind that are going here. Okay. How technology tends to have that acceleration that is exponential. Exponential, yeah. But mm. but we we keep hitting these like blocks to where current technology only will allow us to get to certain speed or, okay. or size or whatever. Like Moore's law. And that's it. That's it. Sisters. Yeah, like we're we're hitting both of those, but as we get into this, like some of the quantum stuff and all of that, like oh, I, yeah. I I don't know. There's no longer those built-in kind of caps, right? Yeah. Yeah, but who knows how far off that actually is, but it is coming. You're absolutely right. And these are just proven proven trends of human-made technology that we're all we're all aware of, right? They have been proven at this point so far. And it's going to take a a real groundbreaking shift to change some of those realities. Quantum uh <sighs> Sorry, quantum technology, I should say, may be one of those game changers. One thing's for sure, however, the big thing that is going to stymie progress in this situation is the secrecy. Mm. Because until we can understand, if you don't know the depth and breadth and specifics of a problem, you have vastly reduced your uh, ability to solve for that problem. And I feel like that's part of why the stuff that the public is seeing that's being trotted out feels kind of frivolous because it's sort of like a fun, new, shiny toy that gives us agency to play around with this new tech in a way that's like entertaining, you know? Oh, it's no big deal. Look, it's just like a weird new Instagram filter, TikTok or whatever. But actually there's much more going on beneath the surface and much more energy being expended that, that we don't have a, uh, a view into in terms of like the transparency of how much is this actually affecting our resources. Yeah, I think that's a good point because we also we also have to realize that this is emergent technology, which means that any numbers people do pull are going to be pretty perishable and perhaps less relevant within the span of just a month which is nuts to think about. It's bonkers, but it is true. And also, you know, Pandora's jar has unscrewed. You can't put AI back into the box. This is not Dune, where they have the Butlerian jihad against thinking machines. They're on the way. Uh, this is overall a good thing if we can figure it out. But my, my uninformed hope, I'm trying to be optimistic nowadays, uh, is that... You know, we've seen we've seen uh, machine learning models make tremendous improvements in engineering, right, both in the space of weapons, but also in the space of civilian tech and really arcane problems that maybe maybe a couple thousand people in the world would even understand. Right. Uh, And this this stuff, these spells. That's what I mean. Programming is basically casting a spell. Right? Oh, we've talked. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. it's like incantation. The, the, and the, right. the best people that understand the language can do the best version of the spell. So these algorithms, these things, these creatures conjured through these spells uh, seem to have a clear advantage on 
improving concepts of engineering. They're better at that than they are at having a human-like conversation. So maybe, this is my hope, maybe uh, we can, while we're still heading toward that inflection point, like you were talking about, Matt, maybe there's time enough before the car hits the tree or goes over the cliff, Thelma and Louise style, maybe there is enough time to get some of these machine learning projects onto renewable energy and maybe hopefully disprove the statements of Chuck DeVore, who's also, you know, a politician. No. Fair enough. I would ask you, when have we ever done that? <laughs> um, and I, it does feel to me a lot like the folks that are wielding this stuff, you know, at the highest levels are big time putting the cart before the ecological horse. Mm. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent, guys. I think there's time for all of us to decide social media is no longer worth it, and we can just rise above, and we will no longer need memes and AI generated oh, cartoons. And there's a world where we go outside and we take tree limbs and we play with them like swords again. Touch grass. <laughs> you should run for office, Matt. That's very stirring uh, stump speech there. But only at night. Uh, yes. See, yes. This is why you see the problem with coalition parties <laughs> in politics, right? Matt pitched an idea. Mm -hmm. One of us was on board, right, Noel? And then the mm -hmm. other one was, was saying, Caveat. I agree, <laughs> asterisk. Mm -hmm. We're only doing that at night, right? No, that's fine. Dusk stick swordsmanship, that's what we'll call it. It'll there be wonderful. That's our party. That's oh, our whole man. platform. It is. Uh, this is something probably to look at in a, in a bigger uh, you know, deep dive. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'm going to keep this one short. Um, that's it. Basically, that's the gist is that and I don't know that it's necessarily that surprising to anybody. But here it is from some, you know, folks that more or less know what they're talking about. And we have to wonder, too, um, what our timeline looks like for that, you know, for that possible inflection point. You brought a statistic that I really want to underline, Noel, which is the idea that these machine learning models and these infrastructures could become countries of their own in terms of power consumption. And the question then is, you know, we're, we're not the experts, obviously. We don't pretend to be so, uh, but we would love to know what you think that timeline might be. Is it going to be in our lifetime? You know, are we going to run into it at that point or I don't know. It feels like things are accelerating. There's a snowball. Okay. So the guys, these GPUs, they give off a tremendous amount of heat. That's one of the mm -hmm. big problems, right? Right. Do you think there's a way we can design a system that captures the heat from the GPUs to then turn that into power for the GPUs? To spin interesting. The, the water, <laughs> That's spin interesting, the Matt. <laughs> there there are certain home uh, appliances or like you know on the you know like heaters and things that actually harness heat uh, from the ground sure. and Geothermal you know energy. Ge that's yeah. exactly right so i mean it's certainly possible and i for example have a dehumidifier that runs down in my studio all the time and it pulls moisture out of the air like you just got to wonder if this is a thing that should be being discussed like how do we take a byproduct and turn mm. it into a net gain a net Classic positive human yeah. It, it would be like a hybrid engine, the way they use the wheel movement to right. then recharge the battery. Mm -hmm. You would use the heat from the GPUs as it's generated to recharge the power system that's supplying the GPUs. Guys, we can do this. Basically, you just need to figure out how to take something we already have and use that to spin something to create more power. So we could also link it to um, tidal power, which oh. I, I'm quite bullish on uh, because – the grant because mm. it's free right right what if we had hundreds of thousands of people locked in rooms with uh, an electric uh, bike of some sort where they would pedal on the bike and it's it would generate <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and also like what you're talking about too would only work in uh the largest of the of arrays in one location right and that would also require large-scale buy-in from these giant corporations and unless they were ac absolutely uh you know, forced to do this or it was some sort of marketing move because things had already gotten so bad they needed a win in terms of like public opinion, only then would they do it. They're not going to just do it on their own. They're not going to benevolently say, here, take our AI GPU heat and like do something, you know, let's, let's figure mm -hmm. out how to funnel it 
It's the same reason that we can't you know, desalinate the ocean or like it, it's way too expensive and requires a lot At of energy. Scale. Right. And there's At a scale. lot of, yeah, there's a lot of really fascinating technology that's going on here. And, and folks, we want to tell you, if you are a physicist and you clearly know why, like you clearly know why these projects uh, that we're spitballing haven't been done yet, Write in and let us know. No, we want to I, hear from you. No, God, no, it's man. Pitches, pitches. Your, <laughs> also, wait, 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 wait. This is this is a double edged sword here. Give us the facts and then give us the crazy part. We want to hear you pitch a weird idea, and we want to hear. You know what I mean? Like, yes, the, it's a big thing for us. We don't like to show up just with problems. We like to bring solutions. And I'm not suggesting anyone wants to desalinate the ocean. I'm just talking about in terms of another source of, re- of, no, of no, drinking water, day. of renewable. Yeah, yeah let's, let's just get rid <laughs> of the had ocean. It's, it's desalinate, had desalinate. desalinate. I mean, look yeah, at the let's way, blow up the moon while we're at it. Yeah, you know? look at the way the human civilization is. They've been on that f- the ocean thing for a while now. Right? For real. And we're going to keep going. I'm sorry I've cursed so much, but folks, we hope you enjoyed this evening's strange news. Uh, we are going to return with even more explorations. Uh, we want to hear from you, legal experts, non-legal experts, people who are worried about things in general. Uh, let us know. Uh, also, uh, well... A million other things. We'll catch up next time. We try to be easy to find online. Find us online at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on Facebook. With our Facebook group, here's where it gets crazy on X, FKA Twitter, and on YouTube, with video content coming at you on the regular. On Instagram and TikTok, you can find us at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff Show. The heat sinks on the GPU rather than just taking that heat away and accepting it. Accept They're like it turbines. In, yes, they accept it and they transfer that heat. I can see it, you guys. I can see it. If you want to call us, call one eight three three S T D W Y T K. That's our voicemail system. When you call in, you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Do give yourself a cool nickname. We don't care what it is, and we're excited to hear what you choose. Let us know if we can use that name and your voice on one of our listener mail episodes. And if you've got more to say, then can fit in one of those tiny little three minute maximum voicemails. Why not instead send us a good old fashioned email? We are the entities that read every single email we get. Uh, we also received just now an interesting piece of correspondence from chat GPT. Hey, chat GPT. We asked, how do you think we can fix the problem of AI creating excess carbon emissions? ChatGPT said, uh, it's a multifaceted approach, integrating technological, operational, and policy measures, improve energy efficiency of AI models, green data centers, sustainable practices, distributed and edge computing, awareness and collaboration. You got a little TED talky at the end. I'm but, wondering uh, if green data centers are a thing we should look at in the future, too. Does that involve some kind of harnessing of Thereby, I wonder if what you're describing see, see, that yeah. is a thing. You know, it's very, it's too good to not so be. Green data centers. This is exactly what I was talking about. Powered by renewable energy sources such as solar. Sorry, Chuck Devore. I respectfully disagree. Cool. And also yeah, ask yeah. some questions about your campaign funding. So uh, anyway, I don't know about this guy. You you seem to know a bit more about this guy than I do. So I tried to at least have two perspectives. But uh, yeah. Ed, Ed, they're right. Uh, obviously, this is a conversation we're going to pick up again because we're uh, we're all heated up about it. I've even turned my screen red, I think. Uh, you look con- heated. You're really hot under the collar, man. Walk with us into the dark. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.